can you see my screen now? Great. So uh, let me just go to the, okay. So this is the outline of uh, the presentation. I'm gonna talk about treatment of advanced disease. I'm gonna skip this one because you will see this as light repeating. Basically we'll start with treatment of uh, frontline um, uh, or frontline treatment or first line for patients with uh, metastatic disease. Let me, can I get rid of the pictures here? Yes. So this is basically uh, the two studies that established the first line uh, treatment in these diseases, in this disease, gemabraxin in the MPAC trial and fulfirinox in the Prodige, which uh, are our standard of care. There's no trial that have looked in the metastatic setting at, at a head-to-head -head comparison. But if you look at uh, the, uh, how can I get rid of this one? Are you seeing the pictures on your screen? I'm, I don't know if you see my full screen or you're seeing the pictures of all the people that we have on the call and you're not able to see my full screen with this. It, it looks really good. We see your presentation. It looks quite nice. Perfect. So, so if you look at the hazard ratio, it's clear just by looking at the hazard ratio that the magnitude of the benefit with Fulfirinox was substantially higher than the magnitude of the benefit seen with Gemabraxin on the impact uh, trial. Now, this is a high level overview of these two studies. It's a busy slide, but there's five aspects that I want you to remember. The Fulfirinox trial has a limit for age at 75, and indeed very few patients really were elder than uh, 70, as opposed to the uh, Gemma Braxton trial that really had no age limit. Uh, there was a small group of patients, around 8% of patients in the MPACT trial that had, uh, that were frail patients with a, a performance status KPS of 70. And this patient population actually in the subgroup analysis did not seem to benefit. Now they did something a little bit tricky because they grouped patients with KPS 70 and 80 when they presented that analysis. But if you look at the subgroup of KPS 70, there was no survival benefit from Gemma Braxton in that subgroup. So basically, just with this trial, we, we don't have data to recommend Gemma Braxton to frail uh, patients. We will discuss later a study that has addressed this. You can also see that the second line was more likely to be delivered to patients that were uh, in the uh, PRODIS trial. And this has to do, of course, uh, with uh, uh, disease biology, patient selection and performance status. You see also that uh, the median dose intensity on, on both of these trials was indeed very similar. Higher rate of grade three neuropathy with Gemma Braxin compared to Fulfirinox and higher GI toxicity with nearly 15% of patients having a significant grade three diarrhea in the Fulfirinox uh, trial. Now, uh, obviously we, uh, we do see uh, elderly patients when we are treating this disease and we have very limited data to recommend this treatment to patients that are older than 70. There's some retrospective analysis that shows that this patient population may tolerate treatment well, but if I, I'm using this as an example to show you how uh, highly selected these patients were. This is a study, retrospective study at MD Anderson, six years follow up. They only enrolled 24 patients. That's four patients per year in a very high volume center like MD Anderson. And you can see that one every four patients require admission through their treatment. And half of those admissions were due to infections. In addition, 40% of uh, patients require treatment discontinuation due to complications. And in addition, 25% of them had treatment discontinued because either physician or patient choice, which suggests some additional toxicities. Uh, so although the conclusion of the authors was that this had a similar toxicity to what we see in younger patients, I don't think we can all uh, fully agree with such a statement. So um, as I mentioned, there's no head-to-head -head comparison, but uh, the Napoli 3 trial is currently ongoing. And it's looking at Gemma Braxin versus uh, Nalidif Nalidifox, which is a modified Fulfirinox where the liposomal idenotecan is replacing uh, standard idenotecan. Uh, this is based on an earlier trial where um, they uh, concluded that the treatment was well tolerated, but you can see that uh, the dose of oxaliplatin for the randomized phase three 
it's uh, lower compared to what was used in the um, uh, PRODIS trial at 85 milligram per square meter. So this suggests that uh, there's uh, still significant uh, toxicities. I, uh, as I mentioned, the study is ongoing. I don't think this will change our standard uh, of care. Uh, um, I, I doubt that uh, Nalidi really is a better drug compared to Fulfiti. We do have randomized phase three data in the second line that we don't have for Fulfiti, but it's really hard to believe that this is gonna be a game changer for these uh, patients. Now, um, what um, the Fulfidinox trial that established uh, Fulfidinox as standard of care gave everyone 12 cycles of fall feeding oats. This trial also conducted by a French cooperative group look at standard of care 12 cycles of fall feeding oats versus eight cycles similar to the uh, stop and go approach that we use in colorectal and then after eight cycles patients continue with maintenance uh, five a few per degram on schedule. The third arm was a sequential treatment of fall feeding followed by uh, gemcitabine, and the primary endpoint was six months progression-free survival uh, rate. Now, this was not really a, a comparative phase two. Uh, they, they rule out that the, the arm with fulfiti followed by gemcitabine had similar activity to arms uh, A and B. And you can see that six months progression-free survival with continuation up to 12 cycle was not really that different or not different at all to uh, continue with maintenance five a few after eight cycles of uh, oxalic planning. And indeed, what you can see is that the median survival was uh, not uh, different, again, without formal statistics. Uh, and when you look at uh, overall survival at uh, 18 months, there was some edge to uh, the um, maintenance five a few, 28% uh, versus 18%. Uh, Again, this was just exploratory analysis. The other thing that is very interesting that if you look at the end, okay, there seems to be some separation. Blue line, it's maintenance five a few versus red line, 12 months of, sorry, 12 cycles of uh, fall feeding. Uh, whether this separation has to do with reintroduction of uh, oxalic platinum or not, it's not clear. Only 30, around one third of the patients were able to have uh, oxalic platin reintroduced after um, uh, it had been uh, dropped. And you can see interestingly that there was more grade three, four neurotoxicity in the maintenance arm, which is sort of the opposite to what we would expect to see. And this has to do also with uh, increased dose uh, intensity uh, in this group due to the reintroduction of the oxalic uh, platin. This is a Spanish trial, the Fragrance trial, that uh, look at gemabraxin in patients with uh, poor performance status, PS2. And this is to address that small subgroup of patients that was included in the MPAC trial. There were four different treatment uh, groups uh, when the phase two started with only six patients each. The first group with a higher dose of abraxin uh, was too toxic and this arm was dropped. The uh, arm C with treatment every two weeks had similar activity to the other two arms and was also dropped. So for the phase two, they end up enrolling patients, uh, around 100 patients in these two schedules. The arm B was a, a standard schedule with a lower dose of abraxin at 100, and arm D was the standard schedule. Again, this was not a randomized trial. So patients were randomly assigned, but there was no uh, randomization. So you can see that 15% of patients had locally advanced disease as opposed to the impact trial where 100% of patients had um, metastatic disease, no locally advanced. And this led to some imbalances. You can see the group of patients that received the lower dose of uh, abraxin, 6% of them had uh, locally advanced versus uh, the other group that had 15% of patients with uh, locally advanced disease. So that imbalance favoring the, the D arm. But what you can see is that there's diff really no difference in progression-free survival. And uh, the main point of this uh, trial is that the overall survival that was seen in the impact study at 8.5 months, it's actually very similar to this median overall survival that was seen with, uh, in the fragrance study with, in PS2 patients. So because of this data, we do have some safety data now that patients with, who are frail may still tolerate gemabraxin uh, well and be able to uh, achieve similar survival to what was seen on the impact trial. Now, one critique to this study is that 
uh, there was not a second independent observer to determine the performance status of the patient. So this was just assessed by, by one physician. And on the other hand, if these patients were truly PS2 and these patients were truly PS1, just based on that, you will expect to see uh, lower survival in the fragrance trial compared to the uh, impact study, which really was not uh, seen. So either one study enrolled less PS1 and maybe more PS2, or the other one maybe enrolled less PS2 and more uh, PS1, and maybe the uh, patient populations were not so uh, different. So um, we, this is a study that uh, was done by uh, Dr. Baron, uh, who's now uh, at Intermountain, looking uh, at the sequence of therapy. And what you see here on the left side, uh, blue, uh, blue color are patients who started with a first line of fulfidinox, followed by a gem-based uh, regimen. Red line are patients who started with first line of gemabraxin, followed by a 5-FU-based uh, uh, regimen. And you can see that there's uh, some advantage to starting with fulfidinox, around two months improvement in survival. Now, when Dr. Bannon look at uh, the sequence of patients that have got both schedules, so first line gemabraxin followed by fulfidinox, or first line fulfidinox followed by gemabraxin, there was absolutely no difference in survival around 11 months. Now, obviously, when you start a patient on treatment, you don't know that they're going to be able to get to your second line uh, with, the, with the most active regimen. And uh, in general, it is the disease biology and the patient that we have in front what determines which background of chemotherapy we will use. You can see here that uh, the percentage of patients in the uh, group of first line fulfidinox that were able to get second line, 50%, 36% for gemabraxin, very similar to what was seen in both the PRODISH and the EMPAC trial. And you can also see that when we start with a first line fulfidinox, usually, uh, stronger patients, 40% of them are able to get gemabraxin. While when we start with a first line gemabraxin, only 8% are able to get fulfidinox. And this is expected because the reason why you choose gemabraxin is most of the times because you don't feel your patient is fit for fulfidinox. And it will be very unlikely that they will be stronger down the road. Yes, there's a small group of patients that are not very fit because of burden of disease. And if they have a good response to gemabraxin, may still get candidates for fulfidinox down the road, but it's a, a really small uh, subset, a very small percentage. Now, the uh, POLO trial uh, look at patients who have got um, fulfidinox as the first line. These are patients that were highly selected looking for this germline uh, mutation in BRCA. You can see that they screen around 3,000 patients and they were able to enroll uh, 154, so less than 5% of the, of the patients, which corresponds to the uh, incidence that we find of these BRCA mutations. And patients who had had no progression after at least six weeks of uh, platinum-based uh, therapy with a primary endpoint of progression-free survival. So one of the main critiques to this trial is that the placebo arm is by no means a standard of care. So we don't drop treatment on, on these uh, patients. We tend to continue some uh, maintenance um, uh, chemotherapy, either 5 few or, uh, or for feeding. And you can see that uh, although the progression-free survival uh, indicates a significant benefit, three months improvement in progression-free survival, and this is highly statistically significant, there's clearly a percentage of patients, around 40% of patients, I hope you can see my, my pointer, that do not benefit from uh, switching to the um, uh, PARP inhibitor, switching to Olaparib. And you can also see that in terms of overall survival, although the data was not yet mature, they reported this with 46% of the events when they were planning to have the final analysis of overall survival when 68% of the events have occurred. There doesn't seem to be a separation in between these two uh, curves. Now, something that it's important to keep in mind, when we look at response rate, even despite this was a highly selected patient population who had germline BRCA mutations and who had done well on a platinum regimen, response rate is still modest uh, for what we uh, see in other cancer types with target therapy. Although I will still say that it's a remarkable response rate for this uh, specific uh, disease. But I think the thing that it's remarkable is that even in the placebo arm, you see 10% of patients 
attaining a partial response after having drop of the chemotherapy. So these are responses that are carry over from prior chemotherapy. And what this means is that if we look at this graph, if these patients uh, on the red arm have been continued on some maintenance chemotherapy, we may end up having some violation of the proportional hazards uh, hypothesis with these curves crossing over at the beginning, meaning some of these patients that uh, were crossed over to a PARP inhibitor indeed did worse compared to those that may have been continued on uh, maintenance uh, chemotherapy. What well, it's uh, hard to refute is that those patients that have partial responses on Olaparib really benefit from these drugs with a duration of response of two years, which is remarkable and not something that we see with any other therapy in this uh, disease. Now, the benefit of Olaparib was seen across all groups. Doesn't matter if the patient had a partial response or stable disease or fulfitinol, they, they seem to do well. And it doesn't matter what, time of, uh, what type of BRCA mutation they had, they also benefited from uh, treatment. The drug was very well tolerated with all the grade three, grade three toxicities in the single digit, with the exception of anemia, where 11% of uh, grade three was uh, reported, but you can see that the median dose intensity was high at 99%. Now, more recently at ASCO GI this year, uh, Dr. O'Reilly presented uh, the uh, CISGEM uh, data in combination with Beliparib, also in patients with uh, germline BRCA mutations, as well as PALB2. PALB2 stands for partner and localizer of BRCA2, and it's a gene that it's also involved in um, uh, DNA damage uh, repair. You see that most of these patients had uh, stage four disease. This was a small trial with only 50 patients, and uh, with Beliparib, which is a weak PARP inhibitor added to gemcitabine cisplatin. This was a negative study. Beliparib did not improve outcomes compared to um, uh, what was seen with gems is platting. However, you can see here that the, on the water for plot, the response rate was uh, pretty impressive, right? With response rate in the 74%, 65%, again, not significant. With median overall survival of so over 15 months for both arms that compare favorably to any other uh, first line trial in this disease. Now, of course, this is the question of whether germline BRCA mutations are uh, prognostic for uh, better outcomes by itself, better disease biology, and not just predictive of benefit with platinum or, or PARP uh, agents. And I think this question was nicely addressed by Dr. Pease Vian on this um, registry study where they look at the uh, complete genetic testing of patients undergoing palliative chemotherapy. On the left side of your image, you have patients who have not received platinum, and you see red line patients who did not have any mutations in the DNA damage repair pathway compared to those who had mutations, and there was no difference. However, for the group of patients who had platinum therapy, you can see a very nice separation of the curves. This uh, provides uh, data to believe that this uh, mutations are predictive, but not prognostic uh, of uh, outcome, and suggest that uh, support that um, uh, concept that indeed patients with these mutations that are supposed to a platinum-based regimen really derive significant uh, benefit. Now, moving to the second line now, there's uh, only one randomized phase three study that have uh, provided uh, positive results without conflicting data. This is the Napoli one trial that randomized uh, patients with metastatic disease that have progressed to uh, prior gemcitabine based therapy and this predated uh, Abraxin. So none of these patients really had got Abraxin, uh, but this is uh, now our, our second line. They were randomized to three different groups. I'm not gonna comment on the group with uh, Naliri every three weeks because this group really have significant toxicity. So I'm gonna just comment on the analysis of uh, 5-FU versus 5-FU plus uh, Naliri. Naliri, it's a liposomal uh, irinotecan where you can see that the, the active molecule is encapsulated in a liposome. And the hypothesis is that it will penetrate tissue better and it will concentrate in the target tissue for longer, uh, longer time. And this is the, these are the results of the study. You can see overall survival, six versus uh, four months with also some improvement in uh, progression-free survival. But at its best, these results can be considered modest. So if we, have, uh, if we don't have a trial available for these patients, we will offer uh, Naliri. However, 
if we have a clinical trial, I think the clinical trial at this stage represents a better opportunity. Naliri doesn't come without toxicities. Although the authors state that the treatment was well tolerated, you can see that the incidence of grade three, four diarrhea was indeed as high as what we see with falfirinox, with nearly 15% of patients having uh, quite significant uh, diarrhea. So those reductions, especially in patients who are heavily pretreated in the first line, are encouraged. Now, um, one question that we get often is um, whether patients who have been exposed to fulfirinox as in the first line may benefit from naliri on the second. And although we don't have much data on this, the data that the uh, Napoli study uh, provides suggests that uh, if patients have received prior irinotecan, there doesn't seem to be a benefit from naliri. Again, these are really small numbers, but uh, clearly doesn't suggest a benefit in this uh, patient uh, population. Now, what other, they, what other trials we have in the second line? We have a couple of studies that have provided conflicting uh, evidence. The one on the left side is the CONCO-03 trial that randomized patients to uh, a modification of Folfox with oxygen even if weekly um, five of you, and this showed some uh, modest benefit in survival as opposed to the pancreox trial conducted in Canada that compared Folfox to um, uh, five of you and actually achieved the opposite. So patients on five of you seem to survive uh, longer. So why was, was this? This is again a busy slide, but I just want you to remember this. On the uh, CONCO trial, the 5 fe oxaliplanin was given without bolus, as opposed to the pancreox, which was a modified 5 uh, folfox with uh, bolus 5 fe And why this is important is because the dose reductions of uh, oxaliplatin were quite significant in the pancreas trial, and most of them were due to heme toxicity. So uh, in practice, uh, we use folfox, but the message here is that if you are used to if you're going to use Folfox in the second line, you need to use some modification of Folfox that your patients will be able to tolerate. Because if 20% of patients withdrew because of toxicity, it's really difficult for, for anyone to be able to prove a benefit in the setting of a, of a trial. And uh, this is just to illustrate that concept. Uh, again, significant more uh, hematologic um, uh, toxicity compared to um, the uh, control arm, significant uh, um, in, in general, significant, more significant neutropenia, uh, 30, 32 versus 38%. Uh, uh, same with uh, any heme toxicity that you can imagine in the pancreas trial. And this was not really seen in the uh, German study, in the CONCO-3 trial. Now, uh, briefly, because I know we are short of time, uh, this is a review written by uh, one of our uh, fellows, Dr. Nevala, which address uh, some of the target therapies that you will see developing in, in this disease. Uh, keep in mind when you do genetic testing in, in, your, in one of your pancreatic cancer, uh, or if you know that your pancreatic cancer patient is KRAS wild type, that is a patient that you really want to do next gen sequencing, look at a comprehensive uh, 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 panel of genes, because these are the patients where we will identify certain genetic aberrations like fusion that provide nice new treatment opportunities. This is again work from uh, Mike Pishavayan showing improvement in survival. This is not a clinical trial, it's just a registry study where they look at patients who have got uh, genomic testing and uh, red line are those patients who had match therapy, okay? Uh, blue line are those patients who had uh, genomic testing, had genetic aberrations, but did not have uh, much uh, therapy. And you can see that with much therapy, there was some improvement in survival. Of course, there's some caveats with this type of analysis, including that most of the patients got combinations rather than single agents. So it's hard to tease out what is really driving the benefit in, in these uh, patients. And um, I'm going to finish with a couple of examples of, of patients uh, with mismatch repair deficiency. This is uh, one of our patients with Lynch uh, syndrome uh, that uh, came to see us after having been studied on Gemma Braxen. He, uh, she had progression of disease very quickly on that regimen and then enrolled on a trial with Folfox pembrolizumab. You can see dramatic drop in the CA199 as well as improvement in appetite. And you can see quite improvement in uh, deletion in the uh, com uh, confluence of the body tail of the pancreas as well as liver meds. This is sensor in 2017, but this patient is still alive, doing well, and we just saw her four weeks 
uh, ago, and I will show you uh, how her treatment has been going. Just as a reminder, this is a summary from the keynote 158 that look at patients with mismatch repair uh, deficient non-colorectal cancer. You can see that the response rate, 20% or close to 20%, these are highly, highly uh, predicted uh, patients. So a 24% response rate in this, in this setting is remarkable. And this is the same patient I mentioned before, just to illustrate the concept that uh, in general, we tend to continue immunotherapy in these patients uh, if we have a complete response for one to two years. Uh, this patient, after uh, uh, close to uh, two years on, on Pembro, uh, went on a treatment holiday, and off treatment, she had progression seen by this new side of disease on the left adrenal gland. We biopsied this, confirmed this was adenocarcinoma, and uh, she was started rechallenged with Pembro. And you can see how her CA199 dropped. She had, last time we saw her a few, a couple of weeks ago, her CA199 was normal. And we are planning to go again on a treatment holiday uh, in, a few, in a few weeks. So just to refresh you, the ASCO guidelines now recommend testing uh, for uh, mismatch repair deficiency in any patient with advanced pancreatic cancer, given that we have opportunities with immunotherapy in these patients. And the last couple of slides, there's a number of other genetic aberrations that are very rare in this disease. Red fusions are one of those. And this is a presentation at ASCO by Vivek Subaya from MD Anderson, showing three patients with pancreatic cancer with this red fusion. You can see on the, on the waterfall plot, the three of them had partial responses to therapy. So this, uh, this is not FDA approved for this disease. It's FDA approved for uh, non-small cell lung cancer. But again, if you are able to identify this, and these are uh, present in less than 1% of, of the patients, this really uh, can be a game changer for that individual patient. Same for NRG1 fusions, again, very rare events. We do have uh, a trial that is led by Dr. Puri from uh, our lung phase one group that will enroll any patient with any tumor type that have one of these NRG1 fusions. So if you come across one of these, when doing genetic testing on your patients, please think about this trial as an opportunity for your patient. The, the patients that were you need to suspect these are patients who have KRAS wild type disease, in general, young patients. Uh, that's the, the population enriching in these aberrations. And then just to finalize, to finalize uh, first line therapy for Fidinox or, or Gemabraxane, uh, in general, young patients with really good performance status, we think about fulfirinox, consider dropping oxaliplatin after cycle number eight. Elderly patients, poor performance status, think uh, about gemabraxane, BRCA positive, uh, either fulfirinox or gemcis based on this beliparib study that I just showed you, and then continuation with maintenance uh, olaparib. And then in the second line, after first line fulfirinox, consider gemabraxane based on some evidence of uh, activity in, in the second line from single institution in general, or if you start with Gemabrax and um, uh, continue with uh, Nalidi per Napoli 1 trial, or, modi or modified Folfox if you don't have access to Nalidi. And then remember to do genetic testing in all these patients uh, when, when you first meet them, of course, referral to genetic counselor, but then also uh, somatic uh, analysis of mutations to try to unveil some of these uh, novel treatment opportunities. And uh, many of you refer trials here to Hansman. Um, I hope that we can continue to work together and have an impact in, in these uh, patients. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that we have time to make any guess here, but this is my hometown in, in Spain. This is Alhambra, which is a, an Arab um, a castle that was built in the, in the 700 in the south of Spain in Granada. So whenever COVID is clear, whenever we can get these vaccines, if you have time to visit Spain, I will definitely encourage you to, to go and visit uh, Granada. 